Good afternoon and welcome to our COVID-19 update for December 14th. Uh, we'll be joined by Dr. Gail Burstein very soon. And of course, we have Kendra Schmidt here from Deaf Access Services to provide the American Sign Language as we once again have uh, some information to share with the general public. Let me move this mic a little closer. Uh, most recent case data as of yesterday, December 13th, 451 new cases. 4,039 over the past seven days. We have seen a drop in cases on an average daily basis. We'll talk more about that. It's a good thing. Uh, 423 total new cases per 100,000 over the past seven days. This is a substantial drop from where we were about a week ago. And the positivity rate has also dropped in Erie County uh, to 8.5% for that day. And it's been hovering around that now for a weekly basis. Uh, as compared to where it was. So I want to thank everybody for their good work, wearing masks, uh, getting vaccinated, being careful out there. 134,892 confirmed COVID-19 cases in Erie County. Uh, we assume there was a lot more from people who were not tested or who got sick and just never got tested. But uh, we still have COVID in our area. It's still in the very high rate, though it is getting better. Well, this might not be easy to see on the screen, but this is the regional daily and weekly cases. Erie County has the lowest daily and weekly percent positive cases for the 100,000 population in the Western New York region as determined by New York State. Uh, we also include the Finger Lakes region because we want to include Genesee, Orleans, and Wyoming, of course, because they are part of what we consider Western New York, and we are lower than those, uh, generally by 2 to 3% on the positivity rate and lower on the cases per 100,000. This is a good thing. You normally would expect because of our density in Erie County that it would be much higher than these other counties, but it's not, it's actually lower. Uh, other counties and communities across New York State are seeing increases in their positivity rate, as well as their cases per 100,000 residents over a seven day average. We are actually starting to see a decrease. So here's the case data on a week to week basis. So as of the week ending on Saturday, so December 11th, there was a 22% decrease from the week ending uh, December 4th uh, of, of, of total raw cases. And the weekly case count is now similar to the pre-Thanksgiving total. Uh, we did see a big Thanksgiving spike. We kind of figured we'd see a Thanksgiving spike. We saw it. But now we're seeing a decrease in cases and we're seeing a big decrease in the rate per 100,000. As you can see, the seven day case rate per 100,000 persons went to 455 for the week ending December 11th, down from 580 the previous week. And that has dropped even more as a result of the most recent seven day period. So we're going in the right direction now as compared to where we were when it was really bad. And the weekly positivity rate for the week ending December 11th was 9% down from 10.8% the previous week. And we do continue to see that number decrease where it's kind of in the eight and a half percent now. So we are seeing good results in regards to it's decreasing. There are still lots of new cases on a daily basis, uh, but we are at least headed in the right direction, which is the cases and the rates per 100,000 and the positivity rates are going down. Uh, positivity percent declined in all age groups, but children under the age of 18 continue to have the highest positivity rates. Uh, for children or for ages 0 to 17, the percent positivity rate was 10%, so above the rest of the average. And for persons 18 plus, the positivity rate was 8.7%. So we're still having a problem with children having the highest positivity rate giving it often to them from one child to another, whether it's in a school setting, it's outside of a school setting, it's in a child care, it's in a, a sports. Uh, so we are still worried about that. That's why children need to be masked uh, when they're outside of their home setting. And then in the 30 to 39 year old age category had the highest uh, group case total and they've had the highest seven day case rate per 100,000. So it's the 30 to 39 year olds which are often driving a lot of our problems. Now for the week ending December 11th with the zip code, the high numbers are still there with regards to total new cases per 100,000. Uh, the 14202 zip code, which is downtown Buffalo, had the highest rate actually, 
Not a lot of people live there. Uh, Lackawanna was the largest community with one of the highest rates, and I'm very concerned about that. You see Collins is up there. Uh, there were 19 cases in the 14034 zip code. We do know that a portion of those were related to the Collins Correctional Facility, not necessarily in the general community. Uh, West Seneca, the 14224 zip code, actually had the highest number of raw cases, uh, total cases, 238, and was in the top 10 for total new cases per 100,000. Uh, so it is uh, in the urban areas, the suburban areas, the rural areas. Uh, and there are some areas that are doing worse than others. Simple as that. So we remind everybody to wear a mask. Uh, it is important. Uh, opinions are important, but facts matter. And we want people to understand that it is the facts that drive the decisions that we make. And we see, unfortunately, cases everywhere. Uh, the only good thing is they are declining as a percentage of our population and on the positivity rate, so that's good. But these are numbers we would have never imagined just a, a few months ago. So hospitalization, another good thing to talk about. We are seeing a stabilization in the hospitalization numbers. We had a big rise, and then we seem to have stabilized a little bit. What you have in front of you is the hospitalizations for the last two weeks. Uh, they have stabilized. We've seen them reach their high in Erie County of 383 cases on a day. Uh, they've dropped a little but we have seen that number pretty much stay where it is in the last two weeks. Uh, the hospitals are still at or near capacity, depending on the hospital. Uh, we have had some hospitals that were a little, were at capacity that have opened up some beds, so that's a good sign. Uh, but ECMC is still at full capacity for all acute care facilities. I believe Sisters Hospital is as well. But Buffalo Mercy and Chemo Mercy, which uh, had no bed space, now have opened up some beds, so that's a good sign. Uh, on December uh, 12th, 89.9% or 90% of all our hospital beds were occupied uh, and 88% of them the ICU beds were occupied. That is a reduction from last week. Not a big reduction, but it is a reduction and that's a good thing. We're 374 hospital patients on December 12th in Erie County Hospitals. 522 of them were hospitalized across Western New York. We're going to go into a little bit more about that and, and why that is significant compared to where we were last year. So there were 149 non-Erie County uh, f facilities, beds. Let me, actually, let me strike that. <laughs> there were 149 COVID-19 patients that were hospitalized in non-Erie County facilities in Western New York. So that's Niagara, Chautauqua, Cattaraugus, St. Allegheny, as determined by the New York State Department of Health. So vaccination status, people ask this all the time. 69% uh, of those that are COVID-19 patients in Erie County hospitals were not fully vaccinated. 77% of those that are COVID-19 patients in the intensive care units, the ICU, were not fully vaccinated at the time they caught the illness. 79% of those on an airway assist were not fully vaccinated. Now, I just want to remind everyone, airway assist is not as pretty as it sounds. It's generally a ventilator. You do not want to be on a ventilator. It is very bad, really bad. Dr. Burstein can go in a little bit more detail, but a ventilator is basically keeping you alive and hoping that you recover. And a lot of people who are on ventilators have long-term impact for the rest of their life due to serious issues with their lungs. So 80% or 79% of those that are on a ventilator in Erie County have not been fully vaccinated. Now, hospitalizations, I wanted to show these two charts. Here's the Erie County hospitalization data as of March 2020 to present. We talked, we said, I think, 374 patients. Let me just go back, make sure I get the right number. Uh, yes, 374 patients as of December 12th were in Erie County hospitals. And you see, we are not near our high, which was over 450 back in early December. Uh, we have seen these spikes, but we are not near our high. But Western New York almost reached its high when you talk about hospitalization data uh, this past week. It has declined a little bit, primarily because we've seen a decline in Erie County cases. But what the big difference is between last year and this year, look at last year we were over 450 patients. This year we're 374. We reached about 380. 
So there was a difference of about 75, 80 patients in Erie County hospitals compared to where we were last year. But when it comes to Western New York hospitalization, it almost surpassed last year. And our ICU numbers were actually slightly worse than we were in the middle of last year, not the beginning of the pandemic, but certainly in December and January. Why is this? It's because the other hospitals in Western New York are at capacity themselves, and they have many, many more COVID-19 patients than they had last year. They've been averaging 150, 155, 149 on the most recent day, uh, as compared to where they were last year, in which it was 70, 80, usually it was around 50. So there's been a big spike of COVID-19 patients in the other hospitals across Western New York to the point where they are diverting patients out away from those hospitals to other locations, including in Erie, Pennsylvania and Bradford. So we want people to understand this is a regional issue. The hospitals are still pretty much full everywhere. We're doing a little better in Erie. The other hospitals are very full. People are dying in Erie County, just like they're dying, unfortunately, across the rest of Western New York. So the hospital data is pretty revealing to see we almost reached our spike of last year's total just in the past week, even though Erie County really hasn't come close to its spike from last year. It's because there's so many more people that are hospitalized with COVID-19 in the hospitals in Niagara, Chautauqua, Cattaraugus, and Allegheny County than ever before during the pandemic. Vaccination numbers continue to have uh, high vaccination numbers, especially in the older age groups. Uh, we unfortunately have still have lower numbers among children, but we do have a good sign is that based on the data from New York State, all age groups 18 plus have at least one dose at 70% level. So no matter what the age group is, over the age of 18, every age group has an average of at least 70% of the age group at least having one dose. So we're doing better. As we talked about in recent weeks, we've seen more people get vaccinated over the age of 18 than we had seen in recent weeks. It's not thousands more per week. It's not even hundreds more per week, but it is dozens where at various times in recent past, it was just a handful. So there are more people across Erie County who are getting vaccinated for the first time. And that's a good thing. That means they're gonna be protected, especially once they get full vaccination through in, in through them. Mortality data, unfortunately, we have to announce that 52 additional COVID-19 deaths uh, through December 9th were reported. Uh, there was a small handful in November. The rest of them are in December. Uh, so to those who've lost a loved one, including those who may have lost a loved one in the last week alone, uh, my deepest condolences and sympathies. Uh, it really is very sad how many people that have died. Uh, we have uh, lost over 2,200 uh, people from COVID in Erie County alone, 800,000 in our country. And unfortunately, many of those deaths were, could have been prevented if individuals had been vaccinated. Uh, of the 52 most recent county residents to have uh, died or confirmed a death, uh, three persons were under the age of 50, and we can confirm that all were not fully vaccinated at the time that they caught the illness. Uh, on four Erie County COVID-19 deaths since July of 2021, the average age of those who were fully vaccinated, just remind you, fully vaccinated, fully vaccinated is still confirmed to be two dose, two weeks after two doses of the Pfizer and Moderna and one dose of the Johnson Johnson. That may change in the future, but it's still the older standard. The average age was 82. For those who were not fully vaccinated, the average age is 71. And as we've noted lately, not everyone, but almost everyone under the age of 60 who's died from COVID-19 in Erie County in recent months was not fully vaccinated. Uh, Erie County response. Well, let's talk about New York response first. Uh, as we know, the governor announced last week a mask and vaccine requirement for all indoor public spaces uh, that went into effect yesterday. Uh, it uh, will be reassessed in January 15th to prevent further shutdowns. Uh, this is a little bit greater uh, mask requirement than we had implemented in Erie County. In Erie County, we required it for all indoor public spaces. What the governor has done is required it for all places, basically, except for private residences. So businesses, even if you have a back area where that is not open to the public, required to have your staff wear a mask. In Erie County, our mask requirement was such that as long as it was not a public facing location, 
like a, a manufacturer where the public didn't tour the floor, things like that, we were not requiring masking. The governor has issued, through the Department of Health Commissioner in New York State, Mary Bassett, an order requiring everyone, basically, except those that are in their own private residence, to wear a mask. Uh, and I do thank the governor for taking certain action to do this. We see the numbers across Erie County. We know what we were dealing with. We've seen the declination in cases, hospitalizations, and making comparisons to our friends in the rest of Western New York. We believe the mask mandate made a difference in Erie County to help us reduce our numbers, especially as compared on the on what would be considered the per capita basis, the positivity rates, as well as the uh, 100,000 average population over seven days compared to the rest of Western New York. Masks work in our opinion, and, and that's why uh, I do thank the governor for taking that action, but also for calling up the National Guard to help at uh, Terrace View, the ECMC uh, uh, nursing facility, as well as <clears throat> uh, providing uh, assistance to ECMC from the uh, Northwell which is a major hospital system in the southern part of New York State, bringing some nurses up to help ECMC with its issue. Because while our hospitalizations have declined, ECMC is still basically at 100% of its patient count. Now, Erie County implemented a four-phase approach to reduce cases and control hospital capacity. Of course, we've been in phase one. Now we have phase two, which would be a vaccine mandate, phase three, capacity restrictions, phase four, shutdowns. We said we would uh, review after uh, about approximately three weeks of data. So yesterday we sat down, our policy group met, we made a determination based on what we've seen. Uh, we are staying in phase one. So Erie County will remain in phase one as amended by New York State. I have to say as amended, because of course, the governor instituted a mask mandate, which is a little more restrictive than what we have in Erie County. So that is the, the, the rule, that is the rule, because it came from the governor. So the, we will stay in phase one, uh, the mask mandate, or you could have a vaccine uh, requirement as long as everyone's vaccinated and you confirm it through your review of people at the door. But uh, we've seen some positive uh, notes. It's not great what we're seeing in general, but we have said positive notes, which is recent reduction in new cases, positivity rate in cases per 100,000 over a seven day period. Erie's positivity rate in new cases is two to 3% lower than all other Western New York counties uh, that did not have a prior mask mandate, and of, of course, until the governor implemented it. Uh, new York State mask rules will now apply to more locations. We had it for the public facing locations. Now it applies for basically every public location. Uh, when we meet, including private businesses, it just does not apply to private residences. And hospital capacity in the county is stabilized. Uh, we are not seeing that trend upward. Since we did the mask mandate, we've sort of leveled off and we've kind of stayed like that. That's a good thing. We want to see that number go down. Uh, we feel confident in, in the long run it will go down if we continue to adhere, adhere to the rules. So phase one stays in place. Masking works. We know it works. Please wear a mask. Because my mask protects, protects you, your mask protects me, and together we will protect each other so that we can get through this most recent wave of COVID. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Burstein to talk a lot more about some of the things we're doing, including programs that we have upcoming to distribute masks to the public, as well as, of course, the vaccination clinics we have. So, Dr. B. Thank you, County Executive. So uh, as the county executive mentioned, we are um, lo looking out for masking and helping to facilitate masking. So since before Thanksgiving, our Erie County sanitarians have been going out uh, and, and when they inspect restaurants and they look for making sure that people are masking, uh, both the employees and also the patrons. And then also they've been responding to complaints about masking. But you know, in general, our sanitarians have told me that they found that like most Erie County residents, uh, when they go out and look look at people who are masking are you know everybody's masking most people are masking when they're out in public you know of course they're going to be a couple that you know may not mask but when going out when they're going out to restaurants and to um to go out to educate in uh, retail stores shopping um you know grocery stores you know most people are masking inside so on behalf of our erie county sanitarians and behalf of myself and the erie county health department we want to thank erie county residents for masking up and doing the smart thing to protect us all from COVID-19 transmission. 
So our, uh, in addition to um, inspecting and responding to complaints and educating about masking, our Erie County sanitarians are actually distributing masks so to help people mask up. So, uh, so far our sanitarians have distributed 60,000 procedure masks and 15,000 cloth masks to local businesses. We've started out in the most densely populated areas in the city of Buffalo, and now we're branching out into suburban and rural communities. So uh, we are really Really trying to help people mask up and it doesn't stop there um, we've been working behind the scenes to make sure that Erie County residents have access to good protective masks so since November uh, the Erie County has distributed 715,000 masks uh, and and we are distributing more so uh, we are our sanitarians every time they inspect a business or a restaurant um, they bring the masks for the businesses and the restaurants to distribute to their employees and patrons. Uh, we have masks available at all our vaccine clinics, so when you come in to get vaccinated, you can get a vaccine and you can pick up some masks for yourself and your family. Uh, we are also giving masks to group homes, um, homeless shelters. We've been giving masks to Feed Nor Western New York and food pantries. We've given masks to child care providers, uh, senior dining sites, uh, our first responders, and also we've been working with the International Institute to uh, distribute masks to refugee and immigrant owned businesses. So we've been trying hard to get masks out to in our community. So actually starting tomorrow, there'll be more sites that are available to pick up masks for Erie County residents. Uh, we are gonna tomorrow with the uh, Buffalo and Erie County libraries, including the central and branch libraries, will have masks that people can pick up and to take home for their own use. Um, we have, uh, we were also gonna be giving masks to our Erie County legislatures for them to distribute to their constituents. And then we have these push packs that we're um, uh, giving to nursing homes and assisted living facilities with masking and other uh, PPE and disinfectants to make sure that everybody stays safe there. And we're also scouting, scouting out um, new sites uh, throughout the county that we can have like pop-up vaccine, uh, pop-up uh, masking distribution sites so that people can have access wherever they are to good masks. So moving on to vaccines, uh, we just really want to emphasize the importance that everybody the age of 16 and older who is eligible for a COVID-19 booster get that shot. So as you probably all have heard that last week, the FDA authorized Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for emergency use for uh, booster doses for uh, people who are 16 and 17 years old. So now um, any teen who is 16 or 17 years old who received their, uh, their uh, second Pfizer dose six months ago or more, they are eligible to get a booster dose of Pfizer. So I really encourage parents to get their kids that booster dose. It is very protective. Also, anybody who is 18 years or older who received their second uh, Pfizer or Moderna vaccine six months ago or who received their Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine at least two months ago are eligible for that booster dose. So really want to encourage everybody who is eligible to get a booster dose to get that shot. It is so protective. Uh, we know that with these uh, emerging variants in our community, like the Omicron, and there can be other variants coming in, the booster dose is essential to protect people. We know from, there have been some good data published that uh, just, you know, the two doses of the mRNA and one dose of Johnson & Johnson is probably not enough to protect us for these new variants strains. So um, it's really important to get that booster dose uh, for to protect against the variant strain and this Delta strain that can be very deadly. And so uh, we are, uh, we have many vaccine clinics uh, throughout Erie County, um, both uh, through working with our Erie County uh, staff and with our partners. Um, just so to facilitate, make the, make the appointment more streamlined, we we'll encourage everybody, whether they go to our vaccine clinic or another vaccine clinic, is to bring your vaccine card and a photo ID. It's available, it'll just uh, speed up the process of registration. So uh, we, at the Erie County Health Department, we have um, various vaccine clinics where we're offering Pfizer and Moderna to all ages five and up um, throughout the county. So we have a little schedule now where on Mondays, we're at the Amherst Adult Day Services near the Amherst Senior Center 
Tuesdays, we're at the Delavan Grider Community Center. Wednesdays, we're at Chestnut Ridge Park in Orchard Park. Thursday, we're at Elmo Meadows Park. And on uh, this Friday, we're going to be the Orchard Park Fire Company. So all our vaccine clinics operate between the hours of 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, we encourage everybody who wants uh, in a, a, the, those doses, whether it be your first, second, third, or booster, to uh, make an appointment either by calling 716 858-2929 or you can go on our vaccine website at, at erie.gov slash vax v-a-x and uh, see what time and location is right for you and make your own appointment we do welcome walk-ins uh, so people who are like hey i'm in the area i might as well get a vaccine um we of course we prioritize people with appointments so the best time for walk-ins to uh, to walk into one of our clinics is uh between the hours of five and seven usually our clinics are not that busy and it's really easy for us to accommodate walk-ins so we also have some brick and mortar vaccine locations. Uh, we're at, uh, every day, uh, Monday through Friday, we're at ECC South um, between the hours of 12 and four, except on Wednesdays, we're open till seven. Uh, also, we are partnering with Buffalo Home Care. Uh, they are offering uh, vaccines for the Erie County Health Department at their 490 Delaware Avenue office. And also, they have a new location at 5847 Transit Road in East Amherst. It's uh, really in the, uh, you know, in the middle of that big uh, strip mall restaurant shopping area. So uh, they, are, we are, they are open um, weekdays between 9 and 8. So uh, on your way home from work, you can stop in and get a vaccine, um, take your kids after school. And on the weekends, they're also open from nine to five. And so if um, uh, we give other options for vac COVID-19 vaccination, so say you want a vaccine, but it's, uh, you, you prefer get the vaccine in the comfort over your, of your own home, we can do that for you. Uh, we have our Vax Visits program. Again, all you have to do is call 716-858-2929, and uh, we will give your information to Buffalo Home Care, and they will contact you and arrange a time that is convenient for you to uh, come out to your home and get a vaccine. Uh, uh, if you want to see where all our sites are, uh, you can go to, again to our Erie County website at erie.gov slash vax, V-A-X. If you want to see where all the sites are in the community uh, you, that even are not ours, um, you can go to the vaccines.gov website and just to look at you know where, where else vaccines are being offered. And um, we know that um, many pediatricians' offices and, and community providers are offering the vaccine to their patients in their offices, so check with your provider if that's a place where you'd rather get a vaccine and we're also still partnering with schools uh, throughout Erie County to uh, set up uh, vaccine clinics in the schools including in the Buffalo Public Schools so more to come on that so uh, you know again with just in terms of controlling COVID-19 spread it's so important to know your status you know if you have symptoms of COVID-19 even if they're like tiny sniffles um, even if you've been fully vaccinated and boosted it's so important to know your status and get a COVID-19 test so uh, we are offering uh, t uh, free testing at through our Erie County Public Health Lab um, Monday through Fridays uh, we have uh, molecular PCR testing usually the results are back between one and three business days you know usually it's on the shorter side between one to two days uh, we also offer our point of care rapid molecular diagnostic testing uh, for symptomatic K through 12 students and staff um, so um, and and all our is to say that all our positive uh, PCR specimens are sent to UB to do genetic sequencing. So we are on the lookout, we're partnering with UB um, just to make sure that we know if there are any variants like the Omicron in our community. So far, uh, the UB has not found any Omicron, but um, you know anything can happen. So uh, again, for testing, appointments are required for, uh, and we are offering uh, testing to Erie County residents at 716-858-2929. So please get a test. And and it's something to consider if you're going to go to a holiday party. We know that there are holiday parties happening this weekend and next weekend. Um, you want to make sure that uh, that that uh, you're you know not going to be an infectious disease vector and transmit infection to uh, everybody else at the party or your family. Uh, you know, get a test. It's the best way to know your status. 
So another friendly reminder about another respiratory infectious disease that will be uh, coming upon us and that is actually already transcended into our community is influenza. It's, uh, it's almost flu season. So uh, this graph is from uh, this past week's um, New York State Department of Health uh, Influenza la Laboratory Report uh, that looks at uh, reported uh, influenza tests um, throughout New York State. And I want to bring your attention to the red line, which is looking at the uh, number of reported of, of positive flu tests in New York State uh, so far. So you can see that the number is low. We, um, you know, flu, we usually peak in flu season at the end of January or beginning of February. However, the take home points are we do have flu here now. Whoops. Um, it is here now. It's something that we have to protect ourselves against. And you can see that the red line curve is much steeper than the, uh, the, um, the brown curve, which was from 2019, or the blue curve, which is um, um, from um, uh, 2018. So we really have to be careful because we have more flu now than we have in the past three years. So the way, best way to protect yourself against uh, influenza illness is to get a flu vaccine. You can get a flu vaccine at the same time you get a COVID vaccine, the day before, the day after, it doesn't matter. It, uh, that one, when you receive one dose, doesn't re uh, matter where you receive a dose of the other. So please um, look at, uh, talk to your healthcare provider, talk to your pharmacy, get a flu vaccine because that is another infectious disease that can cause significant illness. And we know the hospitals are already full, um, almost at capacity, although we're levering off with COVID-19 uh, admissions. We don't want to see um, another burden of influenza admissions into our hospital and overwhelming them again. So I'm going to turn over to our county executive for questions and answers. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we have seen a declination in cases, positivity rates, and case rates per 100,000. Uh, we are a little concerned about the Christmas season, of course, because we saw a big spike last year as well. Uh, so we know we had a spike for Thanksgiving. It has reduced, seems to uh, be heading in the right direction. We want to continue that trend, so make sure you wear a mask when you're out in public. Uh, and uh, be careful if you're going to a private party and stuff like that, and you know, people aren't wearing masks, you might want to, you wish should wear a mask and you might want to consider getting tested before you go just to find out if you're positive or not. So we will entertain questions and we'll start with uh, uh, channel two, Kelly Dudzig. Are you on, Kelly? I am here, thank you for taking my question. So with mass compliance high in Erie County right now, where are you finding the bulk of the spread happening, especially in that 30 to 39 age group where the cases are higher than the other age groups? Uh, I'll talk, turn it over to Dr. Burstein. We are seeing some transmission, of course, still among family units, but uh, in the 30 to 39, it kind of ranges all over the place, so I'll turn it over to the doctor. Thank you. Well, um, according to our contact tracers, as the county executive mentioned, we are seeing transmission within households. That's Households are very high risk of transmission, and that's why our contact tracers you know, really try to target the households for their case investigations and making sure that everybody knows what they need to do to stay safe in the household where there's been a case of COVID-19. We're also seeing a lot of spread in, uh, in social gatherings, you know, people gathering in their house, you know, small parties, or uh, large parties, uh, you know, people gathering, you know, starting at, at, at bars and, um, you know, hanging out together and then maybe, you know, going to a friend's house. So, I mean, many, much of the spread is, is happening in, uh, in, you know, people's private residences, even their household, um, among family members or at, uh, at, at, at gatherings with, with friends and family. So that's why it's really important, as the county executive mentioned, to, <clears throat> to really make sure you stay safe in these uh, holiday gatherings. Um, you know, wear a mask if possible. It'd be great if uh, you're going to host a party, you make it a requirement for all your guests to be fully vaccinated and maybe even boosted. Uh, and then, um, you know, making sure that uh, keep the gatherings uh, smaller is safer. And then asking people to get a test before they, where they arrive. So those are all things that we we can do to uh, to decrease the risk of COVID-19 spread during the holidays. We don't want to see, you know, an, another uh, surge in cases uh, like we did after the Thanksgiving holiday. Thanks. Uh, 
Uh, Sandra Tan, Buffalo News. Hi, thank you. Um, a couple of questions. One, um, this might be for the, the health commissioner. Is there any difference in approach um, this time around through this most recent uh, uh, surge in contact tracing or enforcement measures that the health department is undertaking? Uh, and on an unrelated matter uh, for the county executive, you had previously stated that you were hopeful that you would be able to publicly announce the bones of a uh, stadium uh, lease deal, just the broad terms. Um, by the end of the year. I don't know if that's still the case, and if not, uh, when are you thinking that would be happening? Uh, well, I'll answer the question regarding the uh, football stadium. The, the discussions are ongoing. These are complicated discussions and transactions. We're not talking about the equivalent of a lease for a three-bedroom apartment. <laughs> We're talking about a potential new stadium for the Buffalo Bills for the next 30 years. There's a lot that goes into it. Uh, so the negotiations are still go ongoing. Our council talks almost every day. Principals talk frequently. Uh, and uh, I would just say that when we have an opportunity to announce a transaction, we will. Uh, we are not there yet. If we were, you would have heard about it. <laughs> we would have announced it. But uh, the, con the discussions are ongoing. And uh, I do know that yesterday, council talked once again, the council for the bills and the state and the, and the county. Uh, and we continue to move forward until we reach a point where we can announce a, a deal. I don't want to get into the particulars of where we are at this point, but we are, discussions are ongoing. And yes, I'd like to get it done by the end of the year. The most important thing is to get a deal done. Whether we announce it tomorrow or sometime in January, it's to get a deal done that is a, a fair deal for all. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Burstein and answer the first question. Thank you. So, you know, we've had a huge surge of COVID-19 cases in the past couple weeks. So with uh, the Erie County Health Department, we've really had to prioritize our strategy in terms of uh, case investigation and contact tracing. So number one, we ensure that every single COVID-19 case that is reported to the Erie County Health Department gets contacted by one of our, our case investigators within 24 hours. Uh, usually it's much shorter than that. You know, as, as soon as the, uh, the lab report is hot off the press, um, we will uh, hope try to reach out and contact uh, that individual, let them know that they're positive, uh, let them know what they do need to do to <clears throat> isolate safely and prevent transmission to um, the people around them. Um, we also are aggressive about uh, pr you know, prioritizing the high risk uh, close contacts. So the highest risk close contacts are people in the home. So we conduct a thorough investigation looking at who those close contacts are in the home, making sure that they all know that they've been exposed, um, determining if they need to quarantine, if they haven't been fully vaccinated, and uh, the signs and symptoms that they need to look for uh, to um, as uh, if they were possibly uh, develop an infection themselves, making sure that they know to mask, uh, and then making sure that they understand that they should test five to seven days after their last contact. Contact. And even though they're all living in the same house, it's really important that the case isolates from the rest of the people in the family to uh, prevent um, you know, continued risk of transmission. So, uh, so we also prioritize uh, school contacts. So uh, anybody in uh, K through 12 or uh, daycare, um, we uh, make sure that we uh, prioritize uh, those case investigations and we notify all close contacts in schools and daycares. So again, we see transmission there. Those are high risk vulnerable populations. So again, we make sure we do a, you know, complete a contact tracing, case investigation, uh, contact notifications in those settings. So with um, just in terms of uh, other close contacts in the community, um, we work uh, closely with our, our uh, cases to make sure that they understand who their close contacts are in the community that are outside the household or outside schools and making sure that they understand that they need to notify themselves uh, their close contacts that, that um, you know, they're positive, uh, their close contacts uh, could be exposed, and they should take the appropriate precautions either to quarantine if they're not fully vaccinated 
or, uh, or making sure if they are fully vaccinated that they're uh, watching out for their symptoms, making sure everybody's fully masked for 14 days, and uh, make sure that they get a test five to seven days afterwards. So this is a strategy that we've implemented. Um, the state supports this. We work with our state contact tracers in a, uh, very the same protocol that we're using. I'm talking to my uh, local health department, uh, uh, public health directors and commissioner colleagues, many of them are adopting this strategy or strategy too. So, um, and uh, for people that need documentation of either their isolation or quarantine period, um, they can uh, get all of that from our Erie County Health Department website. They can download those documents themselves, um, you know, attest that they did uh, isolate or quarantine and put down the specific dates and, uh, you know, and attest and they can use that uh, in terms of they need to uh, provide documentation to their employers or to their school or, you know, to whoever. So uh, that has been our uh, prioritization approach. So we um, and we feel that uh, you know that this is working. You can see that our um, you know with masking, vaccinating, uh, the contact tracing approach we have with prioritizing high risk close contacts, that our numbers have stabilized and is even started uh, decreasing, including in the hospital. So uh, we will continue with that approach for now, where our numbers are high, and we can reassess once our numbers start to decline even more. Okay, uh, Emily Stoll from B News. Do you have any questions? Um, yes. So I know we've talked about the uh, the numbers for like who's fully vaccinated, who's only got one shot. Um, what are the numbers looking like for boosters, and how many people are getting those? Uh, I believe we're around twenty five percent of adults have been boosted. Doctors nodding her head with yes. We can give you the exact total. Uh, it's not where we want to be. We know the booster is the key especially with Omicron. It seems to offer tremendous protection for Delta and Omicron. So uh, if you have not gotten your booster, you should get your booster. Uh, you, remember, you can still catch COVID even if you're fully vaccinated. Uh, COVID, the vaccine protects you. If you're boosted, it really protects you is what the data shows, especially coming out of Europe. Uh, but we'll get you the exact number with regards to uh, the, uh, those that are boosted. We believe it's, uh, I think it's around 25% of uh, of those that are 18 and above. Uh, Emily Watkins, WBFO. Hi there, thank you for taking my questions. I have two, um, hopefully quick questions, and they're probably more for um, the health commissioner, but um, I I'm wondering about, obviously we, there's not only two outcomes with COVID, right? There's not just you fully recover, there's hospitalization. I'm wondering if the county um, has any information about what the outcomes are looking like for people um, as far as, um, you know, after hospitalization, you mentioned a lot of people on airway assist often have longer term um, health issues or health conditions after that. So I'm wondering about what things are looking like as, ter as far as the non-lethal outcomes of COVID right now for people in Erie County. And I'm also wondering how the high COVID case rate is impacting people who have medical conditions that leave them at higher risk for COVID-19 or infections, such as people who might not have a full response from the COVID vaccine due to transplant or medication. So I'm wondering, two questions, what are the non-lethal outcomes of COVID right now? And are we seeing um, rates also increase in people who um, have health conditions that put them at higher risk of COVID? I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Burstein to answer as best as she can, because I'm not certainly of all the data. Right. So, uh, thanks. Those are, are great questions. You know, unfortunately, um, from the Erie County, you know, health department side, from our surveillance side, you know, we don't receive data about outcomes of people who've uh, recovered from COVID-19. You know, from the medical literature, there's still like a significant proportion of people who, um, you know, before COVID might have been, you know, well, have no underlying disease, who continue with residual um, symptoms for, you know, months after uh, after their like official, you know, recovery of COVID-19. Most common symptoms 
that uh, persist are loss of uh, taste and smell, um, you know, also, uh, f you know, fatigue, um, the, you know, those are, uh, and, and also some, um, you know, uh, res you know, some, like, you know, coughing and, and um, some uh, respiratory difficulty. So those are the most common symptoms, and for some people, they can persist for months or longer. However, you know, from the Erie County Health Department side, from the surveillance side, we don't have exact data from that. You know, I'd encourage you to reach out to, um, uh, you know, hospital-based physicians and um, see what, uh, what they're seeing among their patients that have been discharged. Uh, I believe that uh, UB has, um, you know, the, the specialist, like the pulmonary specialist, uh, may be following um, many of these cases. And then uh, just in terms of the risk for people who are immunocompromised, uh, we, and we know that uh, people who are immunocompromised who develop a COVID-19 infection are much more susceptible uh, because um, even if they've been fully vaccinated in boosters, you know, they still may not have the functional antibody response to protect themselves against a severe illness and death. And uh, you know, um, you know, in addition to people who are immunocompromised um, because they have a hereditary disorder or they're receiving a medication for um, for uh, some type of autoimmune disease or for cancer, you know, everybody, all our seniors are immunocompromised, and the older they are, the more immunocompromised they are. Especially people over the age of uh, over the age of 80. I mean, they are like extremely immunocompromised. So, um, you know, it's it's really important that we make sure that we you know keep our most vulnerable uh, protected. And, you know, and again, um, you know, we don't have uh, information on all our cases, the immunization status, but we can look from our hospital data and from our um, uh, death data that, uh, you know, many of those people end up in the hospital and unfortunately uh, end up dying of COVID-19 related disease are, uh, do have comorbidities, and so they are more vulnerable, and that's why it's really important that uh, that um, they get fully vaccinated in boosters, so they get their third dose, and then af six months after their third dose of a Pfizer or Moderna, then they get their booster dose, so, so they can get four doses total. And then also the people around them have to be boosted, make sure that they mask, because we have to act like a cocoon and protect those vulnerable people by making sure that we don't get infected so that we don't transmit infections to them. The that's all something that we have to work together as a, as a community and as a family to make sure our most vulnerable populations stay well. Thanks. Uh, Tim Wenger, WBEN, are you there, Tim? Uh, yes, sir, thank you, Mark. Um, you know, you probably heard the governor's briefing earlier today and she was peppered with some questions about enforcement. You've had the mask mandate in place here in Erie County for a few weeks, and you've cited the results of it. Um, enforcement is being questioned. She said that the enforcement is in the hands of the county, yet there are you know, municipalities, there are businesses who are not enforcing um, the mandate. Can you just uh, who who's in enforcing it, and what ramifications are that? There's a little break up there, but I think you're talking about enforcement. Uh, we have had our sanitarians go out since we issued the mask mandate. Uh, they will continue to go out. They will educate. We offer, we, I should say offer, we issue warnings before we issue fines. We generally find that if uh, our sanitarians go out and they issue a warning, that uh, when they return that the people are following, the businesses are following the rules because nobody wants to be fined. Uh, and so that's good that they're actually following the rules. Uh, they're, they're there's a very vocal minority that is against masking, but the majority of folks understand it. We know that. The majority of folks in Erie County, the majority of folks in New York State, the majority of folks nationwide support this as an, a, a, a measure to prevent the further transmission of COVID-19. So uh, while there may be some out there who are like, I don't have the capability of doing the enforcement, some of the smaller counties, it's understandable if they have very, very small health departments, in which they may have five or six people in the whole health department because the county is a very small health department. But uh, we have the capability here. We've been enforcing all along and we'll continue to enforce. But the most important thing lately is uh, businesses have been following the rules. Uh, even those that may be <laughs> begrudgingly doing it, they're following the rules. And that's the key, that uh, businesses are following it and our sanitarians are going out. Uh, I would suggest if you have additional questions, you should uh, contact the state and, and determine what the state 
says, the governor said something earlier, but we we enforce the rules. We'll enforce the rules as they pertain to Erie County. We'll enforce the rules as it pertains to New York State. And uh, I would just hope that uh, media understands they need to get the fair message out. And uh, when uh, individuals, whether it's on the radio or television, are advocating against following the rules, they're, they're only creating more COVID in our community. And then media outlets should be held responsible for that. Next How comment. Next, you had your question, Tim. We answered it. Uh, Channel 7, WKBW. And then on for Channel 7, we'll move on to Channel 4, WIVB TV. And Channel 29, Fox 29. Okay, then the last question will go to Spectrum News, if uh, Spectrum is still on. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate all the media's participation. Uh, it's important to get accurate information out to the public, as I've said before. Uh, facts is what, is what matters. You're entitled to your opinion. You're not entitled to your facts. The facts are that uh, our numbers have been declining in the last week or so. Uh, our case rates have been going down. Our positivity rates have been going down. Our rate per 100,000 over a seven day period has been going down. Uh, we're doing better than other counties in Western New York that have not until recently had a mask mandate in place because of the governor's order. Uh, I think that goes to show that people in Erie County are understanding the situation. They're putting on masks. They may know somebody who's gotten COVID-19 and is sick recently or hopefully not, but I know a lot of people who've unfortunately run, had people who died as a result of COVID-19. So uh, I thank everyone for following the rules, doing what's right to help protect our community. We are all in this together. We are our brothers and sisters keeper. Uh, as COVID-19 numbers increase rapidly across the United States, we need to do our best to protect ourselves here. And I wanna thank everybody for taking the correct action so that we are protecting ourselves and we're keeping our case rates down and our hospitals don't get overrun with patients. Uh, because remember, it's not just about COVID-19, it's about what happens if you're in a car accident? What happens if you are in a, in, in a, uh, have a heart attack? And I'll give you an example of it. Uh, this has not been publicized, but earlier today, an Erie County employee who works at our public safety office on Elm Street was crossing Elm Street, and was hit by a vehicle crossing Elm Street. The vehicle sped away, it's a hit and run. We do not have information on the vehicle. The employee was injured, uh, broke a leg, was taken ECMC, needs surgery, has to stay overnight. So uh, I do offer my best uh, wishes to our employee who unfortunately was hurt as a result of someone's negligence who hit them on Elm Street. If you have information about this accident, if you witnessed it, if you got a license plate, please call our uh, 911 uh, dispatch center so that uh, we can uh, deal with this issue. Uh, but this is an example of it. An employee was walking into work today, crossing Elm Street, was hit by a vehicle, was severely injured, taken ECMC. It sounds like the employee will recover, but required surgery to fix uh, the broken leg. If there had been no beds available, uh, the ICU was completely full, I don't know what that outcome might have been, but there were uh, beds available in the ICU. And so our, our employee could be, could be taken care of and uh, hopefully successfully will recover. This is not just about you. This is about us. This is about all of us. It's about protecting our public so that we're not only continuing and stopping the continual spread of COVID-19, but we are ensuring that there are beds available in case you are unlucky and get in a car accident or have a heart attack. It is about all of us being our brothers and sisters keeper. I want to thank everyone for doing that. It has made a difference. Uh, we are headed in the right direction. We're doing better than other parts of New York State right now when it comes to our rates are declining while other areas are going up. And uh, to everyone, regardless of where you live, uh, I just ask you to wear a mask, uh, to protect yourself and to protect others. Uh, and then we will all get through this together. Take care and uh, until next week, be safe and well.